Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. And joining us every Thursday, and of course, other days, popping in with emergency reports. Tim Alexander, our anchor for the live stream TV channel, uh, geopolitical military top analyst. Uh, and from a Christian point of view, Tim, you've got some interesting revelations dealing with a whole range of things, but I guess you can start off with, as you mentioned just before the break, the issue of uh, Petrus Romanus. Uh, the final pope and what's going on with Pope Benedict, uh, what's happening in the Catholic well, Church, pope which Benedict is the largest... Is pope yep. Benedict anymore. He's uh, Pope Emeritus as of uh, okay. three Emeritus, years ago. I guess call he, his abdication yep. took effect. <laughs> uh-huh. First time in 598 years someone resigned. Um, I, I did a, uh, a video called An Open uh, Video Letter to the Cardinal Electors of the Roman Church by Lord Sterling. Right. And um, in this video, and by the way, it's on YouTube, and you can also find uh, a link to that on my blog, Europe. Just do a Google search, Lord Sterling Europe. Um, I spent about three minutes talking about the sex scandals and said basically the last two popes have tried to sweep it under the rug and Hollywood spun it and so forth, and that really doesn't work. Uh, they should have dealt with the issue. They should have ended mandatory celibacy many years ago. It has nothing to do with church dogma. Popes were married for centuries, as were bishops and priests. Um, and I said uh, they could quickly not only do that, but they could. Uh, there are many permanent deacons around the world, um, and they're married in most cases or widowers, and uh, they could be quickly ordained as priests because they're fairly well trained and experienced. Um, and within 30 days, you can have uh, many tens of thousands of new married priests. Um, you've got to do that because it's bec- the church. Uh, the, the priesthood has become so gay in many countries like the United States, you're looking at 50 to 60 percent of the priests are gay. And I don't believe that's how Christ intended his church to be. Um, it never used to be that way. I had three cousins that were priests. And uh, it, it just distorts everything. Okay, the, 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 but the bulk of my message to the cardinal electors is not about the the uh, sexual perversions as bad as they are. Uh, it's about the fact that the next pope alone uh, of probably all people on earth, because he's got about 1.2 billion Catholics behind him, he actually runs his own nation state, the Vatican. Um, if he chose to use his moral authority uh, against the global banking cartel and the, the Illuminati, the people that are driving us towards total economic ruin worldwide and towards the Third World War and absolute police, high-tech police state tyranny, he could, uh, he could make an enormous difference. And the enemies uh, of the human race, which certainly include the global banking cartel families, are determined to keep organizations like the, the Christian churches uh, neutered as much as possible. Because you have to remember, if you add all the family members of the eight or nine families that constitute the global banking cartel, um, you're talking less than a 1,000 people. Throw in the second and third stringers and maybe 10,000 people. There's over 7 billion people on this planet. The Rothschilds are estimated their wealth is about 252 or no, 232 trillion with a T uh, dollars. Roughly half the wealth of the planet Earth is just in that one family. And they want more. They want it all. And Europe, uh, it's so bad in Greece that they're hiring American mercenaries to protect the members of parliament. And, you know, uh, out of seven over 7 billion people on this planet, 2 billion people have given up on, on getting any kind of better job, better meaningful employment to feed their families. And kids in school in America, I mean, what hope do they have? Uh, gee, maybe someday I'll get $10 an hour uh, and still live with mom and dad when I'm 100. I mean, it's, it's sad. And unfortunately, we 
seem to be determined to go down the path not only of economic depravity, but of a global war, a third world war, with uh, the, the continuing efforts that uh, the administration is making in Syria and Iran. And, you know, these people are driving us to the destruction of the vast majority of human beings. If that's not the ultimate moral imperative of this age, I don't know what is. And yeah. the bright man is Pope could lead the charge against that. Now, now uh, do you it, think that, uh, that the leading guy right now, which is Pope uh, the Cardinal Bertone, <coughs> that he's likely to do let something me tell positive? You about leaders me. Going in, let me tell you about leaders going into the concave. There's a famous, and the, the Romans are very witty about this kind of stuff. There's an old Roman saying, uh, yes, uh, they enter the popability, the popability, the ones that are apt to be chosen as pope. They enter as pope and leave as cardinals. And uh, the ones that are often said to be the leaders don't get elected. Now, now Benedict the Sixteenth Ratzinger was an exception to that. But generally speaking, the people that are claimed to be the top candidates don't get elected. Um, I'm not sure why, who's going to get. Why do you think that is? Uh, why it, is it because the well, power structure involves? Uh, look, you've got 117 electors. Uh, this time. That's all the cardinals under 80. Two won't be there. One, I, I slightly know the the cardinal uh, who was resigned as Archbishop of St. Andrews at Edinburgh. Uh, he won't be there. And uh, another cardinal from Asia is sick, and he won't be there. So I think that's in the 117. Uh, no, no, that's 119. So you've got 117 people will be electing. Uh, out of that number, three fourths plus one uh, have to uh, elect uh, the next pope. So that's a lot of politics for very, very few people. And uh, it's really important. It's not just important to this tiny uh, couple square mile country called the Vatican City State or to the 1.2 billion Catholics. It's important because of what I just well, <laughs> excuse me, what I just described. The right man could do grave, grave damage to the evil people that w that are driving us to the Third World well, War uh, and yeah, to here's the let me list the things that I think could be done that could be bad, that the Pope could involve, be involved with. Number one, he could bring some form of ecumenism to bring together Islam and the Abrahamic religions and the Sabbatean Judaism, which we know as Satanism, into a new super religion and try to force every well, other religion. Most, most Christians would go along with that. Well, they won't. That's why we're going to have a persecution. Right. Exactly. No, but the thing I, is, I, though, I, don't think, I don't think any Pope could pull that off. Uh, not, not under normal circumstances, but we talked about this uh, book that's coming out with Chris Putnam and uh, Tom Horn that could have other factors involved that the Jesuits Only the return about. of Christ, literally, would, would something like that happen. Uh, it, the Pope is powerful, but if he well, if he's not so powerful, he's going to get Christians to top into bed with Muslims and, and you know. Uh, oh, yeah. And of course, the thesis that Chris Putnam talks about and Tom Horn is the idea that the that the uh, Jesuits believe that the uh, extraterrestrials or what I call transdimensionals might be involved in a in a great scam to try to bring about a universal world of one religion. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the, the next bad thing that could happen, he could come in alignment with globalism. And apparently, Benedict it hasn't been stated that he's a globalist. So he's not against well, the, uh, the, the the one of the two black cardinals that that's in the running, uh, Peter, and his last name starts with a T, and I I, I, I can't remember how to pronounce it. He uh, his congregation called for a one world currency and a one world government. It's right, right so, and that's the what, world, by the way, Ben playbook. Benedict has Benedict has done that too. And and the third thing that uh, he could do is he could agree to things like uh, uh, the. Uh, the carbon credits, the things, and so on. So we could have some major problems there. So, yes, the Pope could do some very good things if he is to say, is the Pope a Catholic? Well, we hope. Is he a Christian? Most of the new Christians, by the way, in China are Catholic, 80%. Uh, 
Tim. Let's continue with some of the uh, other big stories you have. Uh, and, of course, we're going to post a link up to that uh, video clip, which is an open letter you've sent along to a lot of these cardinals. Uh, the Rothschilds went to Rens Banks. There's only three nations, I think, that have got uh, non-Rothschild banks. I think uh, Cuba, Iran, and I think there's a third. North, oh, Korea. North Korea. That's it. Yeah, those are the only three left. By the way, even Syria has a Rothschild-type bank. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, which is interesting. Um, and Iran, Obama threatening Iran with military strikes in June. Uh, I honestly don't think that's going to happen. And I'll tell you why, because whether Syria falls or not, if there's any attack on Iran, and this is the, I call it the, you know, the, the, the match in the open gas can theory. Uh, if anything starts in the Middle East, it's going to go thermonuclear, biological, chemical, and crazy, where this is going to go global in a matter of hours, not months. So uh, Yes, I agree with you 100%, but here's the problem. There are many credible people who, who, who seem to point to the fact that this is the, the ultimate, uh, one of the ultimate strategic goals of the, the globalists uh, to implement their new world order. They've got to uh, achieve a dramatic population uh, reduction. I, I, and, I don't know uh, that they're going to do that, but we need to have a couple of things happen first prophetically. First, we have to have the state of Israel partitioned and a new Palestinian state set up. And we have to start the blood sacrifice that will be cut off in the last seven years. Which means we're probably looking, we've had uh, Bill Salas on, we're probably looking at something happening real soon. I think in the second term of Obama, we're going to have the peace treaty signed. He has the scroll that was given to Bush by the Sanhedrin. Which means probably in the next uh, three to four years, you're going to see Obama... Uh, sign a partitioning statement and the setting up of the Temple Mount which by the way the Hashemite king of Jordan has now agreed to a peace treaty which means it'll allow the Jews to deserve blood sacrifice on the Temple Mount because the Waft which is under the control of the king of Jordan has control of the Temple Mount not the Israeli government <clears throat> and if he says he agrees to a rebuild a temple by the Jews which can start off with the tabernacle of Moses they can erect overnight we're into the tribulation and the First day has to yeah, be by keep law, in mind, I mean, a tabernacle. I, I dealt with the current king's father because I almost bought his state aircraft, and um, I want to yeah. tell you the the Jordanians are very close to the Israelis. Oh, very close, very and that's why the, very high level. And here's what's going to happen: if the Jordanians agree, uh, you're going to see the ten Jews start the blood sacrifice on Temple Mount, which now they did a survey. Ninety-seven percent of Jews agree that they want the they want the Herodian temple rebuilt and started off with the tabernacle of Moses, which they could literally erect with lights overnight. So in other words, like a movie set, they can put it up overnight. So well, I think we're going to see it happen pretty soon. As a Christian, I have to tell you that uh, I think that would be terribly blasphemous because it implies that the Messiah has not come. And as a Christian, I happen to firmly believe that the Messiah was and is Jesus Christ. Exactly, and here's the point. It's called the abomination that shall desolate. And by putting the blood sacrifice up, it says we didn't accept the blood sacrifice of Jesus, which was complete. And therefore, it's an abomination against the Messiah and God. And it's it's desolate, meaning it will remove Jews from land area because it's a land for peace arrangement. And so it's an abomination that shall desolate. And it's interesting that the leader that's going there on the day we talked about the 9th and 10th of Nisan with uh, Carl Gallops in the first hour, is the very day that Jesus entered uh, the city on the back of a donkey. And as you mentioned, the party that uh, Obama is the head of is the Democrats, which is symbol is a donkey. <laughs> so uh, a lot of things are like, or you're like this is a beyond kind of coincidence. It's like I think God has a sense of humor, to be honest with you. Let's hope so. Yeah, he does. He has a sense because of humor. Because he puts up with the human race. Uh, yeah, well, the thing is, it's a good thing he's God, not us, because we probably wouldn't forgive ourselves from what we're doing. But no, God can. You're, you're completely can, correct. Yeah, he has he, a level uh, of he, tolerance he's and, more and grace. And, and far better than we are, thank God for that. You think God it wasn't for God, we probably would have, if we were in control, we would have sent a finger of destruction to all of mankind <laughs> before we were ever out of the cradle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the next thing is understanding the U.S. NATO profit driven military agenda uh, and the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel. What do you think about this 10 point plan? Let's go through that because this Hagel nomination is scary, scary, scary. Well, it's already it's over. He's, he's been approved, he's been sworn in. I know. In. We also have, by the way, Jack Lew, who is again part of the Chicago mob that was the head of the 
staff or, or Obama, the abomination. Uh, Jack Lew is the worst possible candidate to be the uh, you know the defense secretary in the Pentagon. I mean, this is crazy, real craziness. Treasury isn't it? secretary. Treasury secretary. I mean, Treasury secretary. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like having a fox guard the hen house, and you see eggshells over the fox's mouth, and you're thinking, you like eggs, don't you? It's like, and then the, the it, fox yeah. complains that uh, security is too tight at the hen house. Oh yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure the door's open. And maybe, by the way, let's widen the door so it's easier to crawl let's in. Widen the, the hens. doors. Yeah, let's not have any doors at all. Those hens don't need yeah, all those doors. Right. That's right. It, but, but by the way, it's reducing airflow. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, anyway, well, the, the, so the, the, the the ten point, uh, and this well, that wasn't my open letter, the Secretary of Defense. I don't know who, who wrote it, but uh, it was an article that I have linked. But the, they had several points. My point is, I think, is more important than any of those points is maybe the Secretary of Defense should make a really big effort to avoid getting into the Third World War. Just just a raw guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, 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 being a military expert, you are. Uh, we have lots of reasons to believe that we're. Literally seconds to midnight, midnight, minutes to midnight, like the atomic clock has been monitoring since the dawn of the nuclear age. Uh, then the number two, it says take responsibility for deaths, damage, and harm done by the U.S. Good idea. State unequivocally that the U.S. will abide by Geneva Convention. Number four, stop the illegal use of combat drones. Uh, yeah, especially uh, they're planning to ramp them up so in two years they'll be here with weapons on them. Number well, five, the Air call Force for the closure of already US. has drones that are insect size that can kill. Now, I have yeah. to tell you, in a perfect world where we can trust our government, ha, uh, ha, ha. that's fine. Yeah, right. Ha, ha. Because you can't. Our government is basically run by the criminals in the District of Criminals, uh, not the District of Columbia. And, you know, already... Uh, Senator Rand Paul has now sent three letters to the new uh, CIA director specifically demanding that he answer the question, do you intend to use drones in the United States against American citizens, and do you claim to have the legal authority to do that without a trial, jury, etc., and to assassinate Americans on American soil? And they will not answer his letters. They will not give a clear answer to that. those are the questions that Congress has asked. Why? Because, basically, they claim the power and authority, and they don't want to have to go on record as saying it, and they certainly don't intend to go on record as, as reputing that authority. And, 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 and by the way, think they, about that. Think well, about some that, the because, points, see, if you're talking yeah. about twenty or 30 or 40,000 or more drones, you're talking about setting up a high-tech police state where any time, either in right. your house or outside, you can be wiped out by a government drone. Now, there's one, one of these, I think, that I disagree with in number six, call for disarmament of all nuclear weapons. Well, That's I not going to be done unless... Yeah, unless Jesus Christ comes back, you disarm and you're just like walking into a gang area and waiting to get to slaughter. No. with uh, now Chris Harris talking about the uh, nuclear watchdog no easy task to scrap Fukushima reactor safely. Uh, I haven't read all the article, but I had a quick look at it. And uh, Chris, give us a summary of what this means. And then we'll, we'll talk about real solutions that should be done if they're listening. They should take notes, and then we'll start doing some of this stuff. Well, I, I guess there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, scientists in Japan saying pretty much what we've been saying for a long time now, that... You can't call Fukushima a stable plant. You can't call you can't call the condition cold shutdown because cold shutdown doesn't really exist for that kind of for, for This is a nuclear waste level. disaster site that is a permanent scar on the planet Earth and will be for millions of years. Uh, it, well, it certainly can be that way for. Let's look. I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to certainly say within the next. Uh, Decades. I'm well, we, we can change years. the timeline as we start implementing technology, even what we know now. Um, but looking at this article, it's, to me, it's just a, 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 a flaccid, gutless excuse to not do anything. 
and we're going to repeat the list of things that we talked about. And a lot of these ideas are yours. We need a corium catcher. We can tunnel underneath them and take depleted uranium containers and put and make a corium catcher. We need a seawall to catch the water and filter it out into solid nuclear waste. We need Kevlar spider silk tents over every facility. Don't build a solid structure. Build a tent. Filter out the air and turn into nuclear waste and radioisotopes to solid waste and transport it. Don't dilute it with water and then pump it out in the ocean saying, geez, we got 100 million tons of highly radioactive water that's now seeping into the groundwater table. Then they need to track down with ground penetrating radar all the steam jets going over to the ocean floor into the land. We now know that even tunnels in northern Tokyo itself or Tokyo outskirts have got radioisotopes that have stepped all the way from Fukushima Daiichi. So covering many, many kilometers have gotten into the tunnels and into the fault lines of the, of the area. Uh, they haven't done anything to literally remediate the issue that if there's a seven-level earthquake, whatever instability, including subduction and, and subsidence that's occurring with these buildings, is going to completely crash and burn. And we have burps of radiation continuously. They're losing the worst possible thing is they're losing all the workers that even know what the plant looked like before it got degraded. So of the list of things that I've given here that we and I have talked about, uh, and I've talked to uh, Aaron Gunderson and other expert nuclear experts, but a lot of these are yours, um, Chrissy. They have done nothing. If I was a professor and I was grading their paper and this is what they told me they were going to do, I'd give them not a zero, I'd give them a minus 100. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, so they would have to like go back to grade school. Yeah, no, no. What happens is we have to remove their brain and put it back in something that actually works. Because Here, this here's is such my, a my question, guys. You got you, you two are quite brilliant on this, but you're not the only brilliant people on Earth. And surely, in Japan, exactly. there are many brilliant nuclear scientists. Now There's you good. know, and I know, they have to have. Uh, some knowledge of this kind of stuff, and they they hear well, what we say, and well, and the point is that they have done nothing. And well, yes, I realize there was a nuclear weapons facility uh, uh, there. Well, they, but they, even they, with hiding that, well, why they said they can't send in workers their hands for two years? They said they said they sent in workers. They're doing what we call a faux skeleton around these facilities and a crane. They can't remove bent fuel rod assembly bundles. What they need to do is use what's called either cabled robots that are radiation resistant or IEEE Promi Atmel Corporation ferromagnetic chip deep space type robots which we have in classified, uh, our classified black op projects for deep space exploration that can stand cosmic background radiation etc. and gamma rays. The fact is we don't do anything that involves classified technology because we don't give a damn about the Japanese or the fact that if a major superquake hits there seven or above, we're going to get bathed in radiation levels that will far exceed a nuclear war. And uh, the fact is, though, the it. Japanese were, 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 really, were really asking for it. In fact, I told the story to Steve Dan and the assistant for Representative Congressman Daryl Issa yesterday of how bad things are. We're going to connect him with uh, Chris Harris, uh, that's his radio name, of course, and... Uh, to get these documents to show they're trying to evade even proper relicensure to make sure they don't start this in an freight plant. But we're not doing anything now that we've found new ways that plants can break down with similar technology to Japan, including hydrogen explosions, criticality, a loss of blackout power causing the loss of containment of the nuclear isotopes and massive radiation release. We have literally not learned anything or changed our behavior in North America at one iota. We are beyond dumbass. This is just craziness. Well, well, concerning that, I thought we had a, a good talk, Dr. Bill, before the program and trying to explore why this would, why, why it would be this way. And really, I think you said it, it came down to the bean counters and greed. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. You see, but the thing is, yeah. it doesn't even make sense. We talked about this before the show. The real issue, and I'm the only one I know in any media anywhere in the world of saying this, and I've known this for over 40 years when I was an environmental scientist before I went into medicine 40 years ago. The biggest issue that's going to strike our world in, the, in sometime this century is peak oxygen. Not CO2. CO2 good. Oxygen, really important. If you lose your oxygen concentration or it drops below a critical level, you have no ozone layer to protect your plants on Earth and the phytoplankton in the upper benthic layer of the oceans from taking carbon dioxide and turning it back into oxygen. And if you kill those plants because you get UV strobing from a super flare of the sun and when the ozone layer is thin because you need three things, ultraviolet light, a magnetosphere which is weakening, 
and oxygen. And you can go with an oxygen meter to big cities like Sao Paulo, Brazil, and other major cities, and you'll see oxygen concentration as low as 11, 12, 13, 14 percent. And when you get levels like that, it's like you're not at sea level anymore, you're at 16,000 feet. And when you get hypoxia, the first thing you lose is your frontal lobes and your executive function. You turn people into zombies. Now that's what's going to happen if we continue to kill the oceans if we move into an ice age, it'll even accelerate it faster because we'll continue to consume energy using abiotic fuel. And I've calculated out the amount of, of oxygen will be consumed if they just use the tar pits and the oil fields of Venezuela. And if they just burn all those off in six months, the concentration of oxygen on the Earth will drop to a critical level. It'll kill every oxygen-consuming mammal and animal on Earth. Every single one, right down to insects. And people don't grasp this. They don't realize you can't continue you know, the only chewing up the oxygen. Can, the only entity that I can think would be interested in doing something like that is literally Lucifer. Right. And here's the thing. is There is an oxygen carbon cycle. There's some stretch. If you slowly put out more uh, carbon dioxide, there's a, there's a delay and a gradual increase in temperature that happens because it has a little greenhouse effect, but it's minor. The biggest thing driving uh, temperature is sunspot activity and the distance to the sun, uh, and and how much rainfall, which actually acts as a radiator to cool the earth. If you move into an ice age, and you're actually getting the less oxygen carbon cycle, and you're still putting out tons of carbon dioxide, and you don't have the benthic layer of the oceans, because now you've got a coronal mass ejection, or you've got a major kill of the ocean phytoplankton, and you're still using tons of abiotic fuel, we have to have a nuclear future, whether it's fusion reactors like the tokamak ones we talk, pebble bed reactors, safe nuclear has to be in our future. People get all ticked off when I say that, but we have to be able to safely move radioactive isotopes to safe storage facilities, not on site. That's crazy. All the old technology needs to go, and the industry is going to kill itself if it doesn't listen to what I'm saying. And the problem is the population thinks we just need to go into the Bakken and all these places and hydrofrack like crazy. Uh, the latest National Geographic is a perfect example. Hydrofracking with toxic chemicals is nuts. It's crazy. If you're going to hydrofrack, use microwave and other technologies, not using chemicals. You can't go in areas or pull the water table directly away from the roots of trees or they all die and the animals shrivel up. Uh, yes, there's lots of places where you can get gasified coal and other ways to get free and to get energy and we can branch over the next 20 30 40 years from abiotic fuels and we'll always always need hydrocarbons to make plastics and chemicals but if you rely as your primary energy source oxygen from little phytoplankton in the upper 30 meters of the ocean 30 feet of the ocean and the trees in the arboreal forest and you continue to poison the oceans and chop down the trees guess what you can't Take out the lungs of the planet and expect to be able to breathe. Bye-bye, Earth. Nuclear Regulatory Commission says the new commissioner is doing a squat. The uh, IAEA is doing nothing and doing it in reverse. We have people like General Electric, one of the so-called czars under the Abomination Administration, who is exporting jobs to China like crazy, including the GE uh, imaging facilities in Minnesota. I mean, it's just one obscene thing after another. There's no plan to stabilize America from extreme weather. Uh, from station blackouts, which now can cause critical loss of uh, radiation containment, such as happened at San Onofre that caused the radiation to surge for four to five days at four to five times background. Uh, I'm just appalled at how incompetent the, the so-called regulatory authorities are and how they're only interested in short-term profits when even the nuclear industry is like they got an elephant gun aimed at both feet. Are they crazy? Do they understand if they have any more disasters, like in Japan, they're trying to shut down everything? And the reason why Japan continues, by the way, all these nuclear reactors is because they love nuclear, because it's stupid to put them there. They could exist in geothermal. It's a deal with the Americans to arm the Japanese to the teeth with nuclear weapons to put a nuclear gun at the neck of China. China and Russia, including Vladivostok and, and Siberia, 
or have a nuclear gun to their neck from the Japanese because they're the third nuclear power, not Israel, Japan. And people need to grasp this, that the Fukushima Daiichi was a unveiling by God to say, I'm going to send an earthquake there, and you people are going to find out that the Japanese were doing a MOX fuel uh, enrichment facility there at Fukushima Daiichi in plant number three. They were making plutonium detonators for nuclear warheads. Of course they were. Yeah, I guess in the development stage, I guess we need we need more and better. I mean, that was um, that's uh, certainly I've had a manager that was said to me, you know, uh, well, it's not good enough yet. We need more of what you're doing, and we need better. And that's for the planning for any kind of an event like that in the United States. But not only in the United States, we find we we know from Fukushima that anything that happens is actually a global event. Now, I hate to well, use well, the word for, global war let, let, let me give you a couple of things that can be done for early warning. Number one, we have satellite-based information from the Japanese electromagnetic monitoring satellite that can see the change in the torsion field or the flux lines of the Earth's geomagnetic sphere. Number two, you can use cryptochromes, which are live molecules that will intense the torsion field, and you can translate that into a torsion field sensor machine that can pick up even before the piezoelectric current crosses the fault lines, which you can also measure to show you that there's an increase in piezoelectricity occurring before built up enough energy to hit what's called a slip threshold. Number five, you can hear subsonic vibrations, which you know occur long before you have a full earthquake, and then you can use noise-canceling technology based on the frequency of those to create noise-canceling frequencies to lock up the fault lines areas or to make them slip smoothly and slowly so they don't have a massive release all in one great big chunk, which is why they're damaging and dangerous. Because most of the San Andreas Fault slides nice and smooth, so many centimeters, I think it's like 40 or 50 millimeters per year, it's when it locks up you get big problems, and it's worse at the surface because four or five miles down, it doesn't do anything, okay? So we know what causes earthquakes. We don't have people to think out of the box developing technology to warn people in advance, whether they're in big buildings. I mean, the stupid warning system they're talking about now, even for California, is to give you warnings to get away from the windows. I mean, <laughs> that's not very damned useful there, people. This is not a B-movie. This is reality. We don't people chucked out of windows at 30 fly floors up in Los Angeles or uh, with buildings falling over like uh, skyscrapers be it like, because they're going to have an upthrust zone where it will move a meter to a meter and a half. I mean, this is beyond stupid. And uh, the problem is that the academic institutions don't turn out people that can think beyond their, their nose or the academic superiors that would bunk them on the head if they think beyond the box because they wouldn't get their master's or Ph.D. degree if they raise questions that the professors can't answer. That's the problem. That's why people like Leonardo da Vinci, Einstein, any great scientist always taught his students to ask better questions, not to, get, to master the body of knowledge of all the previous people that went, because the ones that are going to move forward are going to ask better questions rather than just absorbing like some kind of a maggot the previous mental feces of the previous elite and then reproduce that and say isn't it wonderful how smart they are they're not smart they're just regurgitating smart takes brains which means it takes sweat right Oh, yeah, that's, so, uh, that's, uh, yeah, sweat is, um, it takes some sweat. It takes some mental sweat. That's why what I'm seeing is extremely disturbing. We've got geopolitical disaster coming. We have a, a, a fool that's going to Israel to try to convince Israel not to take care of business. We have uh, the blowing the dollar out. We have a geomagnetic d disaster coming with superquakes happening. We are heading into an ice age that will be very evident by next year, according to Dr. Habibil Adamazatov, Dr. Easterbrook, and other experts dealing with earth changes and cyclical uh, ice ages. Uh, we have fools at the top that are high-level Illuminati Satanists and globalists that are hell-bent on not just acquiring all the wealth of the world, but on killing most of the population once they get all that wealth. I mean, this is really... And I'm saying I'm an optimist. The reason is, to be a real optimist, you have to have a full, clear, 100% disclosure and diagnosis of the problem, and then you can address it, and you better pray a lot, because if you don't have a relationship with the Most High God now, let me tell you, you better start praying there's a God, because what we're up against is so gloriously evil, so dark majesty, horror out of the ninth ring of Hades, if there isn't a Most High God, we're toast. Now you sound like Tim Alexander. <laughs> yeah. We're toast. We're toast. That's why we make a good team. So, Chris, you can give us your comment. What do you think? Well, 
we talked about uh, pretty much, uh, the, I guess, the, the bean counters and the greed and, and the, you know, things like making choices that affect everyone uh, because it bolsters the bottom line. And I think that that's, that's wrong. We need, we're not prepared for any kind of uh, large event that's coming our way that and it affects any, any kind of infrastructure yeah, 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 industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just put it like this way. 1920s mobster would say in Chicago, hey, uh, Al, meaning Al Capone, Al, and this is his conciliary, we ain't ready for nothing, are we, Al? No, we're not. <laughs> we ain't ready for nothing. In other words, everything is totally screwed up, and the people that could solve the problem pretend that it's all okay. Even in Japan, they're telling people, eat your radioactive food and even burn the damn stuff, which is a crime against humanity, to put it back in the troposphere, and make sure they spread the radiation everywhere so nobody will see the peak of radiation caused cancers, birth defects, and other problems in the Fukushima Daiichi and adjacent prefectures or in Tokyo because they want to make sure that they don't see this giant surge of cases caused by radiation because they want to continue the dialectic of using old nuclear technology that's so stupid, storing it on site, and not replacing technology or taking it away from fault lines or tsunami zones. This is let me, suicidal. Let me, you, did, let me just tell you what did spark a, a really great discussion on some of the, uh, some of the professional industry forums uh, for, uh, you know, for, for nuclear power, and it was the meteorite in Russia. And uh, what would we do? What would we do? Are we ready for that? What would the effects be? And, and actually, that, that's, a, that's a healthy discussion. Okay, yeah, well, here, here's the fact. Meteor is unlikely to hit, but an airburst is. If you had a Tunguska-style airburst of a meteor, that's, say, 10 uh, tons, that occurred in northern Japan, it would cover hundreds of thousands of square miles and cover many dozens of reactors. And the airburst would cause an EMP pulse, that would knock out all the power controllers for those uh, stations. It would trigger off uh, earthquakes that, because of the pulse of energy would hit the harmonic frequencies of the tectonic plates. You'd see follow-up earthquakes and volcanic activity, including the uh, Mount Fuji, which is magma chamber is now half full and ready to fill and blow. And the fact is all of this is converging at a time when we're now into the last pope, we're seeing the Obama go over there to try to stop a Middle Eastern war, which is literally teetering on somebody pushing the button anytime soon, and a blow to the world economy, and Obama is spending like a drunken sailor, borrowing 46 cents of the dollar. If Dr. somebody Bill, doesn't think you, that this is bad... Let me ask you something real quick before we run out of seconds here. Uh, uh -huh. What do you think about the CDC advisory on the, the emerging superbug, CRE, 40 to 50% more mortality rate, one year infection you, 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 period? Are you talking about the, uh, the coronavirus? Yes. Yeah. We have three major candidates. The worst of the three is not the CRE uh, coronavirus out of Saudi Arabia and Hajj, which has killed people in Britain. It's the H7 and 3 in Mexico that if it recombines in a mixing vessel, i.e. a person or an animal, a bird, with h 3 and 2 v which is in humans now and is persisting for months and months, or the H5N1 in Asia that has a 70% case fatality rate, I would say we have a, a frighteningly high chance of a major airborne super plague this year. Wow. The United Nations and the World Health Organization will take over, and people will beg for their shots and their RFID chips when death and destruction come.